this week on the Back Table Podcast. I think time is something uh, that we really do have to, to keep in mind because there is no reason to exclude any patient from any revascularization procedure if there are no huge early infarct signs. So if you have someone who's uh, fluctuating with his clinical uh, symptoms and uh, showing up uh, one or two days later and uh, deteriorating all of a sudden, there is still a good reason to go for revascularization. Of course, there's no reason to go for IV lysis because there is a significant uh, risk of intracranial hemorrhage, but opening the vessel is still very safe, even in the very, very late time window. And we know that from diffuse uh, three and dawn data, but uh, we already had patients where we uh, open up M1 segments after two, three days now. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. Serenovus, part of Johnson & Johnson Medical Devices Companies, is a global leader in neurovascular care. Their commitment to changing the trajectory of stroke is inspired by their long heritage and dedication to helping physicians protect people from a lifetime of hardship. Serenovus offers a broad portfolio of devices used in the endovascular treatment of hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke. Today, we're back to talk again about stroke interventions. We uh, previously reviewed IR and stroke interventions in episodes 74 and 75. Uh, and then in episodes 98 and 132, we talked about um, artificial intelligence and stroke management. And then more recently in episode 144, we debated direct aspiration versus co-aspiration uh, technique for thrombectomy. On today's episode, we're going to talk about challenging th stroke thrombectomies and dealing with tough clot. And it's an honor to welcome our guest, Dr. Hannes Nordmeyer, Chair of the Department of Interventional Neuroradiology in Zollingen, Germany at Radprax, and Dr. Matthew Gunis, Biomedical Engineer, Professor of IR and Neuro-IR, Science Director of Advanced MRI, and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Radiology at the University of Massachusetts and at least a dozen other titles and accolades that I don't have time to uh, go through. Gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. So both of you have been in, and remain major contributors to the uh, understanding and advancement of stroke care. And before we dive into our topics, I want to give our guests the opportunity to get to know, you know who you are and what you do. So starting with you, Dr. Nordmeyer, could you tell us a little bit about your practice and the role you play in stroke interventions at Radprax? Yes, sure. I learned with uh, René Chapeau in Alfred Krupp Krankenhaus Essen for more than a decade. And uh, since uh, three and a half years, I'm running the neurointerventional department at the St. Lucas Hospital in Solingen with uh, Radprax. And uh, we built up a completely new department with a completely new team. And uh, from the beginning on, we started with a 24-7 service and we're doing stroke interventions as well as uh, uh, hemorrhagic cases. So the whole spectrum of neurointerventions. Uh, what kind of volume of stroke do you guys see uh, in a given year or month? We're doing uh, 180 strokes this year, probably. Last year we did 150. So we're all, uh, rising numbers from year to year and uh, serving a wide area around the city of Solingen. Who all does the stroke thrombectomy at your institution? Is it just your department or are neurosurgeons or other practitioners involved? So there are just uh, neuroradiologists um, doing uh, endovascular stroke treatment, and that's uh, a team of uh, three, Timo Fong, Stephanie Neuhaus, and me. Um, and we are running the 24-7 service, the uh, three of us, collaborating with an neurology department and neurosurgery, of course, and vascular surgery. Sure. It sounds like you guys have like a full stroke team that gets involved in these cases. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a big stroke unit that is uh, serving uh, over, uh, over the borders of the city, so uh, over regional stroke unit, as we call it in Germany. <laughs> Dr. Normeyer, you're also, um, of course, heavily involved with research and, you know, furthering what we know about treating stroke and other neuro procedures, you know, such as aneurysm embolization. How did you get involved with some of the more recent trials you're doing, like the ARISE-2 study? And Yes, we were uh, in, involved uh, in the ARISE-2 study with uh, the um, neurovascular department in Essen. That's a couple of years ago, and um, I think we contributed 
quite uh, quite a lot of cases to this uh, trial. And uh, now we're involved in other stroke trials for uh, uh, thrombectomy and treatment of intracranial stenosis in acute and elective cases. So that's uh, that's our main uh, topic where we're involved uh, in multicenter trials. Good. I look forward to seeing the results of those. All right, Dr. Goon, it's your turn. So I got to tell you, you know, looking through some of your more recent publications, I was really struck by the you know depth and diversity of uh, you know what you're investigating. It's not just equipment. You know, we're also talking about you know the biomechanics, hemodynamics, uh, clot composition, uh, vessel wall effects, intravascular imaging, microvascular effects after stroke. I mean, even talking about like radial access and animal models. So I was going to ask you, you know, how did your career take you? I mean, you, you know, biomedical engineer and a, and a philosophy PhD to becoming, you know, an international expert on neurovascular disease and intervention and, and on the editorial boards of, you know, really most of the relevant journals in this field. Um, I was just really fortunate. Um, when I was uh, an undergraduate student at the University at Buffalo, um, I got an opportunity to get this scholarship and um, basically was handed a book. And so when I was at university, I was studying to be an aeronautical engineer. So I was going to go build airplanes and I got this book of research projects and it was a program investigating flow diverters. And this is in the early nineties. And that was with AJ Waklu and Barry Lieber. And, uh, so as an undergraduate student, I got involved in neurointervention and, uh, just became really passionate about the space. So I'm just really fortunate. I'm still a young person, but that, uh, my career started uh, from the beginning, just solely looking at neurointervention. And I was just also really fortunate. Uh, Nick Hopkins had created a world renowned um, uh, center uh, investigating um, neurointervention. And uh, that was called the Toshiba Stroke Research Center at the time. It subsequently is now the Jacobs Institute. But, uh, anyways, just a, a really amazing opportunity to get in at, the, uh, at a time where the COIL was just being approved by the FDA. So, really, the beginning hmm. of modern neurointervention. So, it's just really good fortune. You're also the director and co-founder of the New England Stroke Center. Can you tell us how and why you established that and, and really what you guys plan to do with that? Yeah, so uh, that was back in 2006 when um, I moved to the University of Massachusetts with uh, A.J. Waklu, who's a, a world-renowned neurointerventionalist. And so we built that center together. Um, and the center has really taken off in a sense that we're just, again, very good fortune that um, stroke and mechanical thrombectomy has fundamentally changed the space um, to becoming a major uh, intervention. And so, you know, with that good fortune, of course, comes the resources that are necessary to do uh, multidisciplinary world-class research. All right. So both of you have, you know, clearly played an integral role in, you know, the evolution of, of optimal stroke therapy. And so, of course, the question is, you know, today, what do we consider optimal in terms of, of technique and equipment and doing stroke thrombectomy? So you guys shared your background. I'm going to share my own. You know, I'm trained as, you know, as a body interventional radiologist. I picked up stroke thrombectomy in practice after my formal IR training. I was initially trained by neurosurgeons, uh, followed by neuro IR and then more body interventionalists. And I learned with stent retrievers first, specifically the solitaire. Uh, and then when I changed practices, you know, the vast majority of these were done with aspiration first with the penumbra system and more recently with the you know, imperative care zoom catheters, which of course, Dr. Gunas uh, is familiar with having published, uh, you know, a paper on the efficacy of those. Um, they're fantastic catheters. But, you know, the point of all this is that I didn't really notice any difference in terms of efficacy in, you know, technical or clinical success between these two different systems. And I know that's anecdotal, but it's really not just me. And, you know, we have all these case trials and, I mean, case series and trials with, you know, catchy names, and my favorite being the, the badass technique uh, and, you know, captive and save, all these things. They all propose some combination of stent retrievers, balloon guides, and aspiration catheters as, you know, the, the best way to remove clot. But to me, it seems like there's no real, like, convincing data that establishes any of these as superior. I mean, do you guys agree or am I missing something? So I think we're still struggling with the, the most effective method to, to, to pull clots, right? So it's, uh, we tried out anything, pure stent retriever combination with balloon guiding catheters, uh, double stent retriever techniques, um, safe techniques, uh, pure aspiration. And uh, I had the fortune to, to, to work with René Chapeau for many years, and, and we went for double retriever techniques in uh, really in the early years of, uh, of thrombectomy when we failed to retrieve the clot within the first two or three maneuvers. So we, uh, we deployed two stand retrievers and parallel to, to untangle the clot in between of them. And we had really high success rates with that. 
And uh, yes, I think nowadays um, the need is really to have one retriever that makes it all, right? I'm with you. I can elaborate a little bit on that in that, um, please. I think, you know, the, the, at Esment, we had the good fortune to hear the, um, uh, Swift direct study. And what I took away from that is that it was really compelling that up to 97% of successful recanalization, which is defined as Tiki 2B or three. So the, the techniques have gotten and the, the equipment have gotten remarkably good. I think we need to change the definition of success, which is what Dr. Nordmeyer just said. And that is that, you know, it should be first pass to key 2C3, because that's what we know is going to impart the greatest benefit to the patient. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Dr. Normeyer, for, you know, a, a standard large vessel occlusion, you know, what is your normal setup in terms of equipment? We have mainly two setups. In uh, patients with a, a straight cervical vessels, we uh, go for balloon guide catheter and uh, stent retriever technique. If there is any anatomical reason like extremely torturous ICA uh, where a balloon guiding really doesn't make any sense uh, because uh, aspirating from below um, with uh, all the vasculature uh, distal to it having uh, having been stretched and being in a wedge position doesn't make sense. We go for uh, uh, triaxial access with um, with a guiding catheter, aspiration catheter, and the, the microcatheter for the stent retriever. So this is mainly uh, the approach for easy and difficult anatomical situations. And then it's, it's really up to, uh, to the location of the thrombus and, and, and the behavior of, of, the, of the clot within the first one or two maneuvers, whether to change the method or to go on with the stent retrieving uh, approach. You're, do you do most of these uh, from femoral access? Yes, mainly yes. In okay. the posterior circulation, also radial or brachial access, but uh, I would say uh, more than 95, 95% of our cases we're doing by femoral access. Same with me. Um, are either of you aware of any techniques or equipment on the horizon that, you know, look like they could distinguish themselves over the rest? Yeah, I'd be happy to, to respond to that one. Um, there's a new series of aspiration catheters that are very, very large bore, like 088 aspiration systems. And yeah. I think the newest technology that we're evaluating, and, and it, it's in its beginning in terms of clinical experience, um, with uh, the millipede catheter being tested in Ireland and the Route 92 catheter being tested in the United States, I think that reliable navigation of these super large bore catheters to the middle cerebral artery is going to be realized in, in the near future. And I think, again, it's, it's lending us toward what I said is the definition of success, which is, you know, Tiki 2C3 yeah. at the first pass. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I think that's really important to establish that is, is you know, I mean, that, I think there is a big difference between a 2B and a C. I wish all the stroke thrombectomies were you know, Tiki 3. Those are probably the most gratifying procedure that I do. But, you know, everybody who does these or studies them is, is familiar with what we're talking about, the challenging ones, you know, the clot that doesn't budge after multiple passes or the artery that shuts down right after you open it up. You know, on the other hand, those are one of the most frustrating things that I do. And I think it's really important to, to ask what makes them challenging or unsuccessful. Dr. Kunis, you and I talked about this earlier. You know, you published a really insightful review in the Journal of Biomechanics that highlighted four main factors that influence thrombectomy success. For our listeners, it's titled A Clinical Perspective on Endovascular Stroke Treatment Biomechanics. Um, and it breaks down uh, stroke thrombectomy into four factors related to, I mean, broke down into four factors that contribute to success of stroke thrombectomy. It's factors related to the blood vessel, factors related to thrombus, factors related to technique and tools and, and oper operator related tools. Um, and I'd like you to focus for a second, if you wouldn't mind, uh, on those first two factors. You know, you've also published on vascular histopathology and clot composition and in stroke, including differences in clot composition based on the number of passes needed for retrieval. Dr. Kunis, what have we learned about underlying vascular pathology and clot composition and how they affect the likelihood of technical success in thrombectomy? So first of all, I can't take credit for all of that work. I mean, it's, I'm just a <laughs> co-author uh, with a lot of really amazing people. I, that's another really um, thing I've been fortunate in my career is to work with, you know, some of the best people in the world, including Dr. Nordmeyer. But uh, that was uh, that specific reference um, is, is really largely attributed to Charles Marjois and his group in Amsterdam. But um, I thought it was a very thoughtful approach um, to looking at thrombectomy. And what we've learned in today's existing technology, you know, foregoing what is to come, is that um, the success of the procedure relied, you know, largely on the composition of the thrombus. And it was the goal, or, or I should actually accurately say embolus, the thing that occludes the vessel. And so, you know, it's been shown 
groups in Germany are um, collaborations like the Strip Registry. They're clots that have a lot of fibrin, so they're they're, they're typically uh, from cryptogenic strokes or from a cardioembolic source. These fibrin-rich clots, um, essentially the stent retriever or an aspiration catheter can't get them. And it's because with the stent retriever, there's less integration with this tough fibrin structure. So that's the way stent retrievers work is by kind of acting like a, a cheese grater and getting some of the clot in the interstices of the uh, device so that as you pull it, you have mechanical clamping of the clot. And if you don't get that integration, what happens is the clot simply rolls off the stent. That's why it was really an interesting analysis from the Stratus that they found longer stent retrievers are more effective. And it's just because you're giving the clot less opportunity to completely roll off the stent. With aspiration catheters, you can't get adequate ingestion uh, if it's very fibrin rich. So you can't get adequate amounts of clot into uh, the, the catheter. Uh, so that when you pull it, you can't get the entire clot out. So that's these fiber rich clots are, are kind of like the tough clots. And they're probably, I don't know, Dr. Nordmeyer can, can clarify, but it's probably around 20% of the time. That's why with today's existing technology, you know, different stent retrievers that have a different mechanism of action, like a, a Nimbus type device. We've shown that with the technique Dr. Nordmeyer invented, which is kind of to pin the clot uh, with the microcatheter and the Nimbus device. What we've shown um, in in vitro studies um, doing high resolution CT is that there's less uh, relaxation or, or loss of integration with the stent retriever and using a technique like that. Okay. In terms of design, is the Nimbus any different from, you know, a standard stent retriever? Yeah, it's fundamentally different. So it's, um, it's got a unique series of angles on the proximal end um, that are smaller in diameter. Um, it has a stronger radial force. And so, yeah, it's, it's fundamentally a different concept. And that's why it's probably working better with these uh, fiber and rich clots. I don't know if Dr. Nordmeyer would like to elaborate. Yes, it's uh, really impressive to to see the Nimbus device acting in a model with a fibrin-rich clot, where you can see on a uh, under camera guidance how the proximal spiral part of the device grabs uh, the clot and really pinches the clot while the struts close. If you resheath it a little bit by advancing the microcatheter over the proximal part of the device, and we've seen that um, in the lab. And then we uh, we really felt that in real life in in patients it it worked the same way. So whenever we found that uh, the clot was fibrin rich, just by pulling out tiny fibrin rich white or yellow fragments, or just by uh, by getting the feeling that the clot is not reacting to a standard stand retriever. We uh, switched to Nimbus and performed this um, pinching maneuver and really had high success rates. That's interesting. I, yeah, I look forward to seeing this. So, you know, we talk about being able to identify these fibrin-rich clots based on how they look. Uh, Dr. Gunis, you've also done a lot of research on intravascular imaging. Can you tell, you know, with either optical CT or, you know, even more traditional like IVIS, can you tell if the clot composition, anything from them, you know, is there, you, you obviously would be very useful to be able to tell you know, before we start trying to remove these clots, which ones are going to be harder to pull? Yeah, so um, we've looked into it. So, so just to be clear, um, the existing optical coherence tomography technology that's clinically available and the existing IVIS systems are really uh, not designed and not appropriate for intracranial use, so anything beyond the carotid siphon. You'll see scattered case reports of OCT being used in the intradural space, but nothing ever distal to the siphon. And the reason is because okay. of the tortuosity. Um, right. Those catheters, um, essentially the, the fiber that spins the lens, um, it can't work in that extreme tortuosity. But we are introducing a new neurovascular technology that will be available probably within a year. It's a very exciting system. It's basically an 014 wire uh, that has the optical engine in it. And we have looked at it. I think it's going to be primarily useful in the setting of stroke when you have multiple mm -hmm. failed passes. And it's not a tough clot, but rather there's an underlying atheroma or uh, dissection. That's where I think this technology may be particularly useful um, is to is to look at those underlying uh, vascular etiologies that that are not cardioembolic or large artery generated emboli. Yeah, that's actually really exciting. I mean, it, you know, we're talking about peripheral arteries and even veins. I mean, using IVIS has completely changed how we look at some of these vessels. I can imagine that would be a really huge thing in the head. Dr. Norbeyer, what other technical or patient specific elements can result in a challenging or unsuccessful thrombectomy? As I said, anatomy is really an issue. So if we have very tortuous vessels like uh, like uh, an elongated M1 segment that is really dip dipping downwards and then uh, pointing upwards again, we know that all techniques available on the market have a high percentage of failure. 
in, in these occlusions. So if the anatomy is against us, there's still r really the need to go again and again and again for, uh, for the retrieval and uh, to escalate the therapy by uh, switching to a more aggressive device that has a higher radial force or uh, another architecture like the Nimbus or to go for double retriever techniques and really trying to advance a large bore aspiration catheter as close to the thrombus as possible. To, to apply as much aspiration force to the thrombus as, uh, as you can. But I think what uh, Dr. Gunis just said, um, thrombus imaging with an O14 wire, uh, giving us some information on whether there's atheroma or just tough uh, clot, for example, that could be a real game changer. So if we're, if we're having had uh, four, five, six unsuccessful passes and we know that uh, the reason for it is atheroma, we would straight go for stenting, of course. Right. So still, it might be very challenging to get up a, a, a PTA balloon up there in tortuous anatomy. But uh, having early information on uh, the reason of the occlusion that uh, can accelerate the whole procedure and uh, prevent us from spending time on several thrombectomy maneuvers, if we, uh, if we know that uh, stenting and angioplasty would be the right thing to do. Are you routinely doing angioplasty and, and stents for intracranial atherosclerotic lesions? Yes, we do. We do quite a lot of them, and we are going more and more to, towards early stenting and angioplasty if we, if we fail um, to recanalize a vessel with, with all our techniques, because we know that it's, it's always better to keep the, the vessel patent and sure. uh, put the patient to some risk with, uh, with aggressive anti-aggregation than uh, to leave the vessel closed. Yeah, I'm with you. So even if we are not sure that it is uh, intracranial atherosclerotic disease that we're treating, but maybe we're just treating a tough clot that we are unable to remove. It's better to stand a tough clot than to leave the vessel closed. Okay. Can I follow up with a question to Dr. Nordmeyer about, you know, in that setting where you have to do a bailout stenting, first of all, what materials are you using? And secondly, what kind of anti-aggregation of uh, algorithm are you applying? We mainly use the Neurospeed uh, double lumen uh, PTA balloon together with the Credo self-expanding intracranial stand. Now we're uh, also using the heparin coated uh, Credo stand, which is a very, very early evaluation phase. So we just did the, the first... Uh, the Credo stand has to be oversized. So if you use the, the if, you ha if you're dealing with a two millimeter MCA, you would go for a three millimeter stand. And you have to make sure that the overlap distal and proximal to the stenosis is enough because at the end, the stent has less radial force than, uh, than in the central part. So typically, we're going for a 3x20 uh, or 3x15 stents, depending on the length of stenosis. And uh, we, um, um, we under dilate by at least 10 to 20%. So we wouldn't go um, for a three millimeter angioplasty balloon in the three millimeter vessel, but um, we would take a 2.5 millimeter balloon, um, especially in the perforator bearing segments like M1, V4, basal artery, not to occlude perforators and cause this uh, so called snow blowing effect to push atheroma into the perforators. Dr. Gunnis had mentioned the, the anti-aggregation regimen that you use. Um, what are you guys doing? We, uh, we apply GP2B3A uh, antagonists like uh, tyrofiban or aptifibatid uh, right before placing the stent. So sometimes if, uh, if the stenosis is, is really looking uh, difficult and dangerous, we do PTA first, do a run, exclude vessel rupture bleeding, and then uh, give the bolus of the GP2B3A antagonist and then deploy the stent. And um, then we uh, uh, go for a, a flat detector CT, a Dyna CT or whatever it's called, depending on the manufacturer, exclude uh, bleeding and uh, add uh, IV aspirin, which is available in Germany, not in all countries, unfortunately, but I, I really like to add uh, IV aspirin because um, in case of any interruptions of the acrostat, uh, so the tyrofiban uh, perfusion, like patient transport for diagnostic or whatever, or just a, a doctor or a nurse who forgets to, 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 to change it and to, to keep it running, uh, can, can lead to early instant thrombosis. So the aspirin might 
give a better protection together with the other IV medication. And then as early as possible, we switch to, uh, to a double antiplatelet re regime. But this is uh, routinely done next day after CT control, after exclusion of a huge infarct or bleeding. And I think there's a lot of um, exciting research around uh, using P2Y12 inhibitors like Kangrelor that have a very short half-life uh, so that, you know, the cardiologists have a lot of experience with it. Um, and I think more and more groups are investigating that as kind of a bridge to, you know, the traditional dual antiplatelet therapy. Yes, I'm sure it is. But it's also dangerous because it, it has a half-life of only a few minutes, right? So if you stop Kangrelor, the effect is... Uh, gone all of a sudden and that uh, that's a specific risk uh, especially in, in 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 big stroke teams where you have uh, new team members every couple of months and yeah so that's that's the only reason why i'm a bit afraid of cancer <laughs> does it seem like there's you know any increase in the incidence of intracranial bleeds after you know using these you know they're these patients are already at risk of bleeding anyway. Actually not, actually that's, not. So that's, that's awesome. what the data also shows. It's, it's usually around 10%. And um, there are no randomized studies on, on, uh, on acute intracranial stenting in the setting of thrombectomy procedures. But what we know about is, is uh, that we, we help patients and we don't cause many more bleedings than, mm -hmm. uh, than usually. There are also studies who showed that with stenting and double antiplatelet regimen, we have less bleedings than not to stent and have the vessel closed. It's exciting. Yeah, it's paradox in a way, but it makes sense because the brain stays healthy and it's not yeah. going to, to bleed late. This is not something I'm, I'm currently doing. And for me, it would be a great option to have kind of a bailout technique when I get to these cases where this clot just won't budge no matter what I do. One of the things that I struggle with is knowing when to stop, you know, when you've made several passes. In particular, where I struggle is where I see you know, just a little bit of improvement with, with each pass, just enough to keep going, but, you know, never open up the vessel entirely or when, you know, you've opened it up and then it just shuts down immediately. You know, Dr. Norbar, what, what is your end point in these cases where, you know, you, you have trouble opening these up? I can't tell when to stop. It depends so much on, uh, on, on the whole setting. So yeah. if, it's a, if it's a young person and the time window is good and there were no early infarct signs at the beginning of the procedure, there, it's very hard to stop and say, so now, now this patient is going to have a huge MCA infarct. So I almost never stop before getting a, a reasonable reconalization, even if it's stenting an angioplasty at the end. And just to add to that, I think um, there's a lot of advancements in, in imaging in the angio suite. Uh, both uh, Siemens and, and Philips now have these um, CT trajectories that are saddle trajectories. And um, what that gives you is, is much better. It's almost like looking at a multi-detector CT. So I, I'm curious in the future, and of course, this has to be studied, but that if um, rather than having a time metric uh, as, as when to stop, but rather have that informed by uh, a non-con and, and CTA, uh, that might be an option. Yeah. I think that the system you're talking about, the intravascular imaging could be really useful in these cases is, you know, knowing when you're dealing with you know, an intracranial stenosis or a dissection rather than just a hard clot, I think that could really be useful in guiding your management. I hope so. We'll need more data to <laughs> say that conclusively, but that's, that's the hope. Yeah, I'm with you. Talking about post-procedural management in these patients, um, you know, for example, where I am, we use the, the TICI score to guide blood pressure parameter control. But, you know, I wonder if, if the patient with the intracranial stenosis, you know, who's going to require like five passes, you know, might not respond the same way as a young patient with atrial fibrillation. He throws a soft clot. I don't know. I mean, should we be looking at these patients differently? Well, should we be managing them differently? I mean, I think uh, from a pathologic standpoint, these are they're very different types of patients. I mean, they, these lesions are very different. The ones with intracranial stenosis? Yeah. And just the challenging ones in general, the ones that are going to take five, six passes to remove rather than, you know, one and done. I think you have to keep in mind that the cerebral autoregulation in patients with intracranial stenosis has already changed a long time before the intervention and before okay. the acute um, occlusion of the vessel segment. So you really have to to keep the blood pressure low as low as reasonable. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean uh, 80 uh, um, systolic, but it means that you have to keep an eye on them, not to have the blood pressure uh, during the first couple of days above 120, 140. 
and really not allow them to have any peaks in, in blood pressure because uh, these vessels are really not used to high perfusion pressure. So the same in, in, in ex extracranial carotid artery stenting, where we know that these uh, reperfusion bleedings or hyperperfusion syndromes occur uh, especially in patients who have uh, very, very poor uh, uh, perfusion before. So with little, um, little mismatch, bad collaterals, and they, they are at a high risk of re-bleeding or late onset bleeding after a couple of days. Yeah, just to add to, to what Dr. Nordmeyer said, which I think is really important, is um, also what, when regarding the time metrics. So these patients have been suffering, as he said, for many years. Uh, it's a gradual process. And there are data that, you know, there's angiogenesis has been occurring and, and there's, and there's a lot more collateralization, um, in the distal vascular territory. So, you know, that may change the time metric in which to treat as well. Okay. You guys pretty much already covered all the other questions I had. Um, so what else is it important to cover that I didn't go through, you know, in terms of these challenging cases? I think time is something, uh, that we really do have to, to keep in mind because there is no reason to exclude any patient from any revascularization procedure if there are no huge early infarct signs. So if you have someone who's uh, fluctuating with his clinical uh, symptoms and uh, showing up uh, one or two days later and uh, deteriorating all of a sudden, there is still a good reason to go for revascularization. Of course, there's no reason to go for IV lysis because there is a significant uh, risk of intracranial hemorrhage, but opening the vessel is still very safe, even in the very, very late time window. And we know that from diffuse uh, three and dawn data, but uh, we already had patients where we uh, opened up M1 segments after two, three days now. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I just got back from SVIN in uh, Phoenix and Tan Nguyen, a uh, professor here at Boston University, had a fabulous paper that she published in JAMA Neurology that shows, okay, it's not a randomized uh, controlled clinical trial, so that means um, it's not level 1A evidence, but their data suggests that the non-con CT and a CTA uh, are as sufficient for these late window patients as advanced imaging. So advanced imaging should not be a barrier to revascularization in the late window. And I think that, like Dr. Nordmeyer said, probably the most fascinating thing is how incredibly safe mechanical thrombectomy is in all the trials that we have. So it's probably always better to open the vessel rather than not. And I would like to say the, the really exciting thing in the future, um, we already have the ESCAPE um, NA1 trial, which unfortunately did not meet its primary endpoint, but we have the ESCAPE NEXT trial, which I think will be successful, showing that really the future is going to be not just in mechanical thrombectomy, but now shifting gears towards brain protection and, and brain therapy to give patients, first of all, the most opportunity to get a successful reperfusion, so maybe delaying the penumbra, but also uh, reducing cytotoxic and vasogenic edema post-procedure. I think these are really exciting technologies that coupled with mechanical thrombectomy will be a very good solution. That is exciting. I look forward to reading that, and I look forward to all of the research that you know we routinely see from both of you guys thank you both for taking the time to do this uh is there anything else you guys want to cover i think that's it all right thank you so much thank you very much thank you so much for listening if you haven't already make sure to subscribe rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend if you have any questions or comments direct message us at at underscore back table on instagram Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Vivek Prasad. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. And newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.